Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest with an amazing story to tell. It's Sonia Kudo, and she is an expert in the field of tech, and she has a remarkable story about her own personal life and the journey she took to get where she is today. Now, before we begin, I just want to mention that we had launched our store. It's called wellnessessential.store, and it has all different types of wellness products and health products to to help you improve your overall health. So come visit us on wellnessessential.store and we'll be happy to help you with any questions you have and any products you might be interested in. So Sonia, I am so excited to have you on this um, podcast because your story is truly amazing. Why don't you tell people a little about yourself and then what you do and uh, people are going to just be blown away by you because you really do have an amazing story. Well, thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. Um, yeah, so I've, uh, I'm, uh, my name is Sonia, and uh, I live in Toronto, Ontario, but I originally grew in Portugal. So I came to Canada when I was 10 years old. I'm the middle child of five. I have two older siblings and two younger siblings, mm. the, the typical middle child. Um, for the past 17 years, I've been in the tech space, uh, particularly in the software development. So I help companies build custom applications for their businesses. So we're in the business to business uh, field. And I also launched a, uh, a, a part of the business that focuses on working with um, new founders or startups that want to build a product, uh, which is software as a service, SaaS, to go to market and um, test the market and eventually bring on venture capitals to invest in their products. So we help them go to market early and get like a minimal viable product ready. We also have a venture fund. Uh, so I work directly with uh, founders who need more than just uh, getting their product out. They want to be able to have someone who's been there and done it and sort of guide them along the way with marketing and business planning and all of that. Right. Um, and I'm also a breast cancer survivor. So I uh, launched a startup during my breast cancer journey, which was uh, interesting, but um, I just completed my five-year remission. Yay. So best, I'm breast cancer free, which is amazing. And that was a, a long journey for me, which I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about, but um, it was more uh, physical and mental versus um, I didn't have a, a, a typical diagnosis that most women have. So my journey was a little bit different. I find that everyone's journey is a little different, but we'll talk, right. we can talk about that too. Yeah. So that's a little bit about me in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little about your, your journey when, you know, you first were diagnosed and you found out you had breast cancer, were there symptoms before, you know, how did it all lead to, and how did you feel when you first were diagnosed? Yeah. So in my early twenties, I found a lump and I had gone to my doctor and they said, it's just like a water cyst. We mm -hmm. have to keep an eye on it. Sometimes they get it drained, but it was nothing. And so I just sort of let it be. I would get it checked every once in a while. And then in my late 30s, so I was 38 in 2017. And I started feeling like a, a numbness on the side where I knew there was something there before. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of felt it and the lump was there, but it was bigger. So I went to the doctor within a week. And within a week, I went and got tests and uh, did the whole, you know, um, biopsies and uh, that, like all kinds of tests. Yeah. I got my diagnosis uh, that I was uh, stage one. Well, I didn't, I didn't know that it was stage one until after I had surgery. So I knew I had breast cancer. Wow. I got diagnosed at the end of September. In November, I went into surgery. Oh, wow. So. My, because I, I wasn't sure what stage I was at, I knew I wanted to do a double mastectomy because I didn't have a history of it in my family. And right. that just made me feel safe. So I had four surgeries altogether. Oh, wow. I didn't do chemo or radiation. I went the, um, I went the uh, surgery uh, route. And so I had my first surgery to remove my the, the cancer breast mm -hmm. and then I had a prosthetic for about six seven months and then I went in and had a major surgery where I had the second breast removed I had a skin graft taken from my back I had um, tissue expanders put in 
And I sort of had to live with the tissue expenders for about eight months. Okay. And then I went in and had uh, what was supposed to be my final surgery to remove the tissue expanders, put in the, 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 the permanent. Mm-hmm. And then that surgery didn't go the way I planned. First, the implants that they gave me got recalled in Canada. They were oh, actually- gosh. Sir. Um, and when I went through the reconstructive process because I got a double mastectomy. So there's always, you know, some women have one surgery, some women have eight. You never really know. It depends on your yeah. surgeon as well. I feel like me and my surgeon didn't exactly have the best relationship. I felt like every time I went to see her, she was looking at the ground while she was talking to me. So she wasn't really paying attention. Yeah. To what I was sort of expecting. Yeah. So when for my third surgery, because it had to be done. I, I also took the opportunity to remove the implants that were at risk. So yeah. I got that done. And then I had to go in for a fourth to fix further things. And I'm still not quite done. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I've taken like a two year break now from surgery because they it's had a, a huge impact on my body. And I just feel like my body needs it. I had four surgeries in the span of about a year and a half too. Right. Just sort of giving my body time to heal and, and, and process everything that I've been through. Um, but yeah, the diagnosis was, I felt like it was unexpected. There's no history in my family. Yeah. And I just thought, I felt like somebody hit me over the head um, and I was numb for a little bit. My feelings and my emotions about it were like a roller coaster. It was up and down. It's hard to express what I felt like because at the very moment where I got my diagnosis, I felt a certain way. Yeah. And then when I sort of had time to process, mm-hmm. then I had different feelings. So yeah. it was like I was very sad. I was very happy. I was very depressed. I was very, I was in fight mode and then I wasn't depressed again. And it was sort of like up and down, up and up down. down. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I continued working throughout my entire process. Right. And I, that's one of the best things I did for myself. I can't say that all women should do that, but for me, it was good because I'm, I'm used to having my routine. I love working. Uh, I'm passionate about what I do. And the fact that I had a purpose every day yes. to wake up to uh, really helped me. And I launched the product while I was going through one of our products during um, my breast cancer journey. And it, it's the product that's doing the best. And maybe that's why, because I was so passionate about it at the time. Yeah. All, I was going through trauma, but uh, it just did really well. And I think it's because I was putting an extra emphasis on it. I think sometimes when you are focusing not on the problem, but you're focusing on something else, especially when you have passion and you have desire to do it, it helps because it takes your mind off the issue. And then you're not like focusing on it and then dwelling in it and then kind of making it bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where you're kind of getting yourself so worked up that you could actually make yourself feel worse, you know, both mentally and physically. And instead you focused on something that you enjoy to do and it kind of, you know, shut that down for a while and you were able to not focus on having breast cancer, but focus on something that brings you joy. Yeah. I think I, the hardest time, the hardest part for me was after it was all done and over with, Mm -hmm. because during that time I was in, in, in survival mode. Yeah. Yeah. In, I processed, but I didn't really fully process. Right. And when it was sort of like all over and done, I felt really lost. Mm-hmm. because I had sort of been the one thing with any type of cancer, just the C word. Um, yeah. The first thing that comes to people's mind is, you know, am I going to die? Yes. Mm-hmm. I feel like I spent a lot of time preparing. Right. To die, even though I was just stage one. But before I found out, it was months before I found out that. I was getting my affairs in order. I didn't want to be a burden for anyone. So I spent a lot of time just sort of preparing for that. And then I went into surgeries and tissue expanders, you know, being at the hospital for like a part-time job, tissue expanders, I would have to go in and get them filled in every two weeks. And yeah. it was a, it was a needle like this big. And, they wow. would in. and um, that was time consuming and it, it, it uh, kept my brain occupied. But then mm-hmm. when it was sort of all done and over with, I felt really lost. Yeah. And I felt like, you know, I've spent the last three, four years focusing on this. And now that's not 
really there. I mean, once you, I think once you have cancer, it's always going to be on your brain. I think about it on a daily basis. It's never going to go away. Yeah. Um, but I just didn't really know what to do with my life afterwards. So um, I sort of, I knew that I struggled a lot afterwards. And so I wanted to um, start somewhere and help women with the process of what happens after breast cancer. Because right. I think a lot of people focus on um, diagnosis, treatment, um, making women feel good while they're going through chemo and all these things. But then what happens after they get uh, a, a cancer-free diagnosis and what do they do? Every, I think everyone just assumes you go back to your normal life, but that's not, that's not the case. Yes, you do right. to a certain degree, but mentally you don't. Yeah. So I wanted to give back to the breast cancer community, but I wanted to focus on something that was uh, around after breast cancer. So a friend of mine uh, and I, she's also uh, a breast cancer survivor. She's actually a two-time cancer survivor. Wow. We started a um, just a little, you know, community on social media and Instagram for um, women who have gone through breast cancer and just um, talk about, you know, the things that we're doing. It's actually called Life Unleashed. Um, and it's all about us living our lives unleashed. And we're talking about all the things that have to do with life after cancer and how yeah. to cope with your mental health and your body. Like, it doesn't just because you're cancer free doesn't mean your body's still not struggling. So right. a lot of women will go through tamoxifen. It's mm -hmm. a drug that keeps the estrogen levels in your body um, regulated so that if you have any cancer left over, it doesn't feed it. Yeah. So I was on tamoxifen for five years, got off of it and just had to put, be put back on it. But tamoxifen has a lot of side effects and things yeah. that we have to struggle with. So her and I just wanted to create something that, we could talk to other women um, who are going through it or are about to go through it or have gone through it and feel or felt and felt or feel the same way that we do and just have these open conversations because we understand each other. Right. We found that there's a lot of um, charities and groups out there that I are run by women who are not breast cancer survivors. And so right. there's a, a bit of a lack of empathy. There's a lot of sympathy, but there's a, a little bit of lack of empathy in, yeah. the, in the process and the way they do things. So we wanted to do something that was, would give back to like sort of our community. And it's been kind of fun. And it's just, it's a little side project that we work on and we do little things here and there. And we're just building a community to help other women. That's amazing. I, I think that's great because I think it, when you have a community of people, it could be so beneficial therapeutic wise, uh, being able to really, you know, connect with your mind, body and soul and to grow and to be able to move forward. And when you hear other people's input too, sometimes you don't realize things, especially from your own perspective and family members can give you opinions and they can give you advice, but it's, it's not the same as an unbiased opinion. And when you have a bunch of people who've gone through it, who know how you feel, they may come from all different walks of life, but they, they understand where you were and where you're at now. And a lot of people, just uh, words of encouragement, certain, certain advice that might just the light bulb might go off and say, wow, I didn't think of it like that. Or yeah, I'll try that, you know, can, can do so much for a person. And even a few kind words to an individual can lighten up a person's day and, and, and make their whole, you know, their whole day, you know, from a different perspective. It's, I, I think it's very therapeutic. And I think groups like that and communities like that are needed more, but, you know, like you said, not from a synth synthetic, you know, like having sympathy, but from, you know, from an empathetic, you know, way where people understand they're, they're there to help you, support you, but they're not there to feel sorry for you. Yeah. They, they want to make you stronger. They want to help you and they want to see you move on just like you want to see them move on. So I think that's great. Yeah. It's, it's been fun. It's a sort of a labor of love. It's a little, it's a little project for us and it's been therapeutic for us. Yeah. Some amazing people we're working on a couple of uh, collaborations with another organization to to help them uh get to through the same community so it's just it's it, it's growing but it's all about just 
having these conversations with other women who understand. Right. You know, and I think it's great that you you took a, a very a, a battling um, situation and you overcame it and you were able to learn from it and then continue to move on and continue to 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 become who you are today, which is a huge accomplishment. You know, you went from battling, a, you know, a, a disease, overcoming it and learn how to to live it with you know with the fears even afterwards like you said just because you're in remission you know it, it changes the way you look and i know many women that i i I've, I've come across that i've talked to family members too after they've had cancer even though they're in remission they always felt differently they looked at life differently it was never life was never the same after they had cancer it's that's that's a, a a fact. I know I, I experienced this firsthand. It's yeah. hard. It's hard to go back to what we call normal, right? Yeah, when yeah. you go through a traumatic experience, it's not just about changing your life and creating uh, or volunteering or creating community. It's also like, who am I? Who do yeah. I want to be? And if I only have a certain amount of time, it's sort of like, it reminds you that you're not here forever. So it's yeah. like, if I only have a certain amount of time, what do I want to do with it? What are my right. priorities? And and then you sort of, your priorities change. Definitely they change. And you start focusing more on the things that are going to make you happy and not other people. Right, right. Yeah. And I think that's important. I think self-love is very important. And, you know, before you could help others, you really need to help yourself. And I think that uh, the people in our society, a lot of women, especially even men, they lack it. They, they, you know, they feel cause they have a family or they have responsibilities. They put those things above themselves. But then if you can't help yourself first, how are you supposed to help others? And in order to live a, a happy, healthy and productive life, you really do need to take time out and give yourself some self-love. Mm -hmm, for sure. And, uh, you know, I've changed my lifestyle. Uh, I'm not, living the way I used to live. I'm not a big exercise person. I'm not going to lie and say I get up mm -hmm. I get 5 a.m. every day and go work out. No, that's not me. I yeah. do like to wake up early, but the first thing I think about when I wake up is coffee. Yeah. But I do, uh, I do a lot of like meditation now, which is something I wasn't really that big on. I sort of liked it, but I, I got more into it. I mm -hmm. love journaling. That's a big part of what I do. And just eating healthy is my main thing. When I got diagnosed, I felt like I lost complete control of my body. Yeah. And the only control that I had at that point was what I was putting in it. Yeah. So I, be I became a little obsessive because it was like, this is the only, I lost control of myself. And this yeah. is like the only thing that I can. So I became very conscious about what I'm eating and the types of ingredients and, you know, organic versus non and things like that. So I try to be a lot more conscious of that. Yeah. I'm also a lot more careful about like the things that I put on my skin. I think yeah. a lot of people forget that the skin is the largest organ in our body. Yes. And it absorbs about 70% of what we put on it. Not everything, but it does absorb a lot. So yeah. I try to be, you know, I'm a, I'm a skincare fanatic. Mm -hmm. Well, I was I'm not, so, I'm not that much anymore. I used to have like a skincare routine that had like 10 different products in one routine. Uh, so I, I focus more like on being, uh, putting stuff on my skin. That's, um, that is that's not toxic. Yeah. And, uh, just having really good night's sleep. I, if I, if I need to get every day, seven to eight hours, because while I'm sleeping, I know mentally that my body is, you know, resting and my organs are regrowing themselves and doing all that great stuff and the i've i've discovered in this journey the importance of sleep for sure yeah oh, those are such important you know important factors you know that you mentioned because you know we had a person it was a doctor he was a, originally a cosmetic doctor and he did cosmetic surgery and then he switched over to holistic health and oh. he you know after he got cancer and he talked about just what you just said he said he mentioned about how skincare how some the stuff that we put on our face it was a crazy number i don't remember exact the number but it was like over 120,000 toxins go into our skin by the choices we make, 
you know, dependent on the skincare usage, you could have, you know, a few all the way to like 120,000, dependent on which products you choose to use on your face and body. You know, people don't realize how many toxins go into your pores and even the water we use, the quality of water where we live, you know, your pores open up and it goes into our body and it affects our body. And like you said, food is so important. I can go on forever when it talks about when I talk, especially the United States, our food industry is so corrupt and there are so many unhealthy foods with so many artificial ingredients in them. But you really have to think about what you put into your body. Like a lot of the foods are addressed to make it look pretty with different dyes, you know, otherwise they would be like white or very plain colored. And so they put these dyes in there, like yellow dye, red dye, and those are cancer causing dyes, you know, and they put it in our food, you know, all the, you know, a pesticides that they use when they're farming and all these things go into our body. Our body doesn't know what to do with it. So it stores it in our body. And then we have a buildup of toxins, our organs slow down, and then we get to the point where our body just doesn't function well. And then you get symptoms and then you can come down with illnesses like cancer is it's crazy yeah and then we wonder why cancer is on the rise yeah it right? is mm -hmm. it's the air that we breathe with so much toxic yeah i have i knew a lady that um got lung cancer and never smoked a day in her life and it was just they said it was just environmental there's there's just there's nothing they can do right so yeah yeah, I mean, I, I just try to minimize. I know that I'm not going to like eliminate toxins from my routine uh, or my daily living, but I try to minimize it as much as I can just for my own my own mental <laughs> health. It just makes me feel better knowing that I'm tr at least trying to to do something about it. And I think that's so important. And I like the fact that you mentioned sleep too, because we need sleep and most people abuse that and they don't get enough of sleep and their body can't rejuvenate. So all the, all three factors that you mentioned are really important and people really should get good sleep. They should, you know, eat better, you know, and they, and, and the stuff they use on their face and the stuff they use on their bodies, they really should take consideration of look in the back of the ingredients and see what's really in these products that they're using. For sure. And I mean, like, I know that there's all these leaders out there, successful people that are like, I'll die when I, I'll, I'll sleep when I die, or I wake up every day at 4 a.m. and I'm go, go, go. And I'm like, that's just, that's just not for me. I need, I need to sleep seven hours. I'm not going to sleep. Yeah. All mm -hmm. when I die when I die, I die. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now I want to ask you a question. You talked about like afterwards, you going through your ups and downs, your emotions were all over the place. How did you get yourself to the point where you were stabilized enough where you could actually move forward in life and the, and the courage and the resilience you got? How did, you know, how, instead of getting stuck and, and then and being scared and, and, and worry and not live in life, you decided to be courageous and move forward. How did you, how did you stabilize all those emotions and get the courage to move forward and become a success and to create these products that you do in the tech world? Um, I wore a facade for a very long time. I, everyone who saw me thought, uh, you know, I was put together. I was very strong. That's the word that everybody used for me. You're so strong. You have so much strength. Um, and I would wake up in the morning and put that face on. But at nighttime, when I would get home, I was a completely different person. I spent a lot of time crying, feeling sorry for myself, not really knowing what to do with myself. I felt really lost. But then the next morning I would put on that face again. And so um, it was just, it was just, a, like I said, it was a roller coaster, but I knew at the end of the day that nobody was going to help me. I had to help myself. Yeah. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not married. I don't have a partner. I live alone. So I didn't have like a support system around me. So I knew that I had to be my own support system. Right. Not that I'm not going to say thanks to, you know, friends and family who were there for me. But the one person that was there for me constantly was myself. Yes. I was there for myself. I encouraged myself to get out of that funk. I told myself that it was okay not to feel okay. And I told myself that I needed to get out of bed and do something about it if I wasn't going to die or if I didn't want to die. And so I just sort of had like my mind just constantly was going through these different uh, 
thoughts, but I just ha- I just knew that if I didn't stay positive, if I didn't continue, you know, being myself and doing the things that I love, I was just going to probably get really depressed and die. <laughs> yeah. I think it's different when you're like with a partner or you're married and you have kids, you're constantly surrounded by people who are giving you words and telling you things. My experience was very isolated. Yeah. You know, I lost a lot of friends during that time. You know, it's so easy. I guess sometimes people don't know how to react to something like that. And so I had friends who would just text message me, but we're not present. Yeah. And you're sending out a text message is so easy. Um, and you know, I can respond with my, my face on like, yeah, things are good. See you later. And they're like, oh, if you need anything, let us know. Yeah. Like I'm going to let you know. Right. (laughs) And then I would just go into my own space, but I think that was really good. And I think that was really healthy. I think that having going through the ups and downs where I was telling myself, be strong and I got to do this and I got to like launch this company and I got to do really well. That was good. But then it was really good for me to let myself be emotional and yeah. feel sad and cry every once in a while because then I'm letting trauma be released from my body. Right. And I did that quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I did it in secret. People didn't know about it. It was something that I had to do on my own and that I sort of had to deal with. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm glad I, I, I went through that. And I think it was only until about a year ago where I stopped that whole up and down process. And I I think part of being part of a community and having friendships with other breast cancer survivors really helped me because now I can, if I'm feeling a certain way, I have people I can reach out to and be like, Hey, I'm thinking this. And they're like, I know exactly what you mean. And we can have a conversation about it versus yeah. reaching out to like a friend or a family member who doesn't really know how I'm feeling. And then the conversation is going to turn into me um, making them feel better about my feelings or, you yeah. know, like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. And becoming the, the comforter. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it was until about a year ago where I started like really doing the work. Um, reading a lot of books, a lot of meditation, therapy. I've been in therapy for like six years now. And I think the first five years of my therapy was all focused on just breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And I think like the last year is when I started focusing on things outside of that. Right. you're back. Yes. So I think that's so beneficial. I So it really seems like going through therapy really helped you um get all your your emotions out about all the things that happened during can- can- breast cancer and then you also were able to you said as you the last year you were current you were currently talking about other things. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, I mean therapy just helped me build boundaries or um, it's taught me uh, coping mechanisms and how to deal with situations better. I'm a bit of a, of a pushover, mm-hmm. just in general in my life. And therapy brought up a lot of things that I didn't really knew. I didn't really know were there. Right. I know, I know some things, but I didn't know a lot. Yeah. And because I was going through that process, because I was trying to, you know, manage my breast cancer, I decided to to stay in therapy because I was getting a lot of value out of it. And I yeah. think sort of what's helped me you know I feel like today talking to you I'm in the best place in my life that I've ever been that's amazing it hasn't been easy getting there I've lost people I've lost friends I've I've uh, you know seen people uh, women die from breast cancer people that I cared about yeah um, I'm part of a community that's one thing that you get to sort of witness a lot but like I just, I just feel really good where I am right now I'm just focused on 
on me, which is a little bit selfish, but it's okay to do that. Oh yeah. And focus on, on the, the thing that I'm most passionate about, which is, you know, running a tech company and building tech products and changing the world with technology is something I, I love doing. And I just want to do more of. Yeah. So can you tell me a little about your, the, the, the different type of tech products that you're doing right now? Yeah. So my baby is called uh, Menusano. Mm-hmm. And Menusano is a nutrition analysis software. Oh, I like that. Yeah. But it's for the food service industry. So it's not okay. Merch. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to build a tool that would encourage food service, like restaurants and things like that, to show the nutrition labels for food when people are going out to eat or ordering. Yes. And, and so like, People with diabetes, with diabetes can now actually see the carbohydrates because that's they don't care about calories. They care about carbohydrates, right? Yeah. So we provide a tool that was inexpensive that was going to encourage food service to provide this information. It didn't yeah. go so well when we first started it, but now it's um we I actually I relaunched the project the product while I was going through breast cancer, and now we have um we're we're global. We're in Canada, the U.S., the U.K. We have customers all over the world and really what it does is it replaces having to send food to a lab and we do it all through software and the at the end you get a compliant label for your country and that label has all of the nutrients for that dish or for that food that's been manufactured Um, and so it's something I really care about because obviously I care about nutrition I personally want to see the information yeah I also wanted it to be something that would eventually become popular so that consumers could start learning how to read a label and understand yeah. and make educated decisions for themselves and not based on what doctors are saying. And I do think that's the way technology is going. We have so many wearables now and things out in the market where you can really start maintaining your own health without having to go to the doctor every single time. Obviously, yeah. if there's something wrong with you, you have to see a doctor, but you know, you can maintain your, your exercise health and see how that affects you. Uh, you can now have your phone tell you how many steps you, t- you took every day and how many calories that helped you burn. And there's just so many things out there. And I, I love that space because I'm yeah. passionate about health. Yeah. So, um, you know, technology that helps people live better lives is I, I, I love, I don't care about like social media stuff. It's, it's tech that's helping people that I'm, I'm yeah. About. Yeah. I agree. And I like when I, you know, in the U S we'll go to certain restaurants and not a lot of restaurants have it, but certain restaurants do. And they'll tell you how much, you know, each um, entree or each, you know, appetizer, how many calories it has in it, you know, won't go into detail, but you get to have an idea what you're really putting in your body and how fattening it is. And do you really want to waste all those calories on that one appetizer, that one entree? And it makes you double think about what you're going to order. You know what? Maybe I should go with this instead of this, because this is actually a lot healthier and a lot less calories. So I I think it's important for people to realize, because I I think, especially in the United States, uh, you know, we have a lot of restaurants that give you enormous, you know, food portions and people, you know, so many people will just, they're just brought up to, you know, clean their dishes off. And, you know, we, obesity has become so prevalent in our society and they try to use the campaign well, big is beautiful and da, 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 but it's not about that. It's about you're opening yourself up to heart disease, diabetes, you know, so, you know, you know, high cholesterol, we can go on and on and on and on. Diabetes is like, it has increased like three times, you know, and over a short period of time, you know, there's so many other, you know, we have allergies, you know, people don't realize why allergies are so prevalent in our society. Well, it's the food that we use and, you know, what are you putting into your body? And I think it's so important that people understand what they're actually put into their body. And I think that's great that you're making an app so they can actually look and see. Now, is it just the food and the calories or do you go more in depth about uh, different, what type of things do you list on these apps? So we list everything that's compliant in that country by the government. So US, we provide the compliant um, nutrition label that companies can print out to put on their menus, provide on their website, 
um, things like that. So uh, in Canada, we also have the CFIA labels and we also provide UK labels. Mm -hmm. We're expanding to other countries now as well. Uh, but our focus is not just calories. Uh, we know it starts there, right? And you're right, the US, man, I was in the US not that long ago and I ordered food and I was like, uh, is this for two people? It was <laughs> it was a large portion. Yeah. Which I don't think is that different, but I feel like the portions here are not like in the US. Yeah. I was shocked. I was like, I cannot eat all of this. Like, there's yeah. no way. Um, but it starts, I think governments are, are starting to put a lot of legislation in place. So when you go to a lot of restaurants that show that information, they're yeah. legally compliant to do that. Okay. So, uh, and there's certain, uh, criterias that, um, uh, that, that, that they can, like in Canada, you have to have a, a you have to be a chain that has 20 plus locations right. in order to, to, to provide the calories, but it's changing as People are getting more educated now that we've provided it in Canada. And I know the U S has had it for a while. Consumers are getting used to seeing the calorie information and yeah. they're asking for it in the facilities that don't have to have it yet. Right. So I think we're changing consumer behavior by how, by just having access to the information and listen, calories are great, but I think, you know, 20 years down the road, it's not going to be just calories. I think it's starting with baby steps before we didn't yeah. have any. Now we have calories and people are starting to understand what calories are made up of or what it means. But I think down the road, what I would love to see is everything beyond uh, just a calorie. Yes. You know, diabetes, like you said, it's, it's tripled, but it's a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's out of control. Yeah. But if people knew the carbohydrates, not just calories, if they actually knew the carbohydrates that they were eating, yeah. you can't treat diabetes, but you can maintain it yeah. with being careful with the hot carbohydrates that you're intaking. So I think access to all of that information at some point, and I think consumers, we're not going to be doctors, but I think as we're, as we have access to this information and we get used to seeing it, we start understanding it, mm -hmm. we're going to demand it more and we're going to be able to make the right decisions because now we have access to the information. I think the problem started with not having it. Yeah. And now we have it and now we need to make it so that it's, compliant in every single facility every restaurant every place where you t order takeout everything that you eat should have some sort of labeling on it so yeah. that consumers so that we can take control of our health and we can make yes. this you know what today i don't want to be healthy i want to go and eat fried chicken wings <laughs> tomorrow i'm gonna have a healthy day like you know what it's up to us to make yes. that decision. exactly but have access to the information and mm -hmm. you made that decision consciously knowing the information not versus not having that information at all and thinking that you're making a healthy decision meanwhile the hamburger is healthier than the salad yeah yes that, exactly and i think that's what you know people don't realize too is that oh yeah i'm eating healthy i'm eating a salad but i don't understand i'm not losing weight or i'm not this is not happening meanwhile the, the dressing they're putting on just a teaspoon could be like 18 grams of fat, you know, high sugars in it and all this other stuff that they don't even realize. And it's, and it's, you know, it could be simple things like putting less salad dressing. I know people that don't even put salad dressing, you know, or just put in a, a dab of olive oil or a dab of vinegar in it, you know, just changing things can be so much more healthier. And like you said, you, you could have those cheat days. Those cheat days are okay. Awesome. Least, you don't, yeah. <laughs> They are awesome. <laughs> you know, as long as you don't do it consistently every single day, you know, but you know, it's very hard to stay like consistently good all the time. I think you need those cheat days in order to do better because, you know, after a while people are going to get really tired of eating, you know, healthy all the time. You know, they're going to want to dab and maybe have a slice of pizza or something, you know, and it's okay. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I love those stories of people when they go to Europe and they're like, I ate more than I eat when I'm in North America, but yet I lost weight. You and hear that all the time. Yeah. All the time. And it just goes to tell you, like, first of all, they do a lot of walking in Europe. Yeah. Um, and then just the ingredients, quality is different. Yes. And I think North America has a lot to learn. We, 
you know, I think it was in the 50s or the 60s where they started like these massive manufacturing of, of food for population growth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They didn't really think about the long term effects of yeah. all of that. Just like social media. They, no one ever thought, you know, 10 years later, the, the, the negative impact that it would have. Yeah. But actually, they need to like sit, sit back and learn from countries that have been around longer and don't have such a high obesity or diabetes um, to see what they're doing and maybe learn from them. Right. Yes, definitely. A hundred percent. Even when I went to Europe, we ate a lot and, and, you know, even the, the longevity in Europe, it, you know, people live very long lives and why it's because everything's natural. Everything's homegrown. A lot of people eat and they, they, they pick the things in their backyard, you know, the vegetables and the fruits. And, you know, I would have an aunt that used to pick um, dandelions and make dandelion tea. You know, it was just, everything was natural. And she, she, she lived to 103, you know, people just eat differently. Like you said, they're always walking around. They're always walking. And so you don't see the obesity. You don't see as much, you know, terrible sickness as you do, you know, in certain parts of the countries, you know, and uh, yeah, change definitely needs to be made. And I think by having an app, like you mentioned, the one that you produced, people can become more aware. And if they're more aware, then they can make healthier conscious decisions. Yeah. But it's, it's on the, the food creators to want to provide that information. And yeah. That's, and that's what we're doing. We're, we're trying to encourage it and we're going to keep doing it until every facility has it. <laughs> <laughs> I goal. love it. Yeah, no, that's a great goal. That's a great goal. You know, I, I think people, you know, that restaurants need to be responsible, you know, just like, you know, you know, they made a big deal about people having disabilities and having things to help people, you know, get into restaurants and have ramps and this and that. Well, let's be responsible and let's show people that what the food is and how healthy it is and it's certified and it has a label on it and, and so forth. Yeah. One of the things I've learned and I'm not going to say what type of food it is or what country it's from because I don't want to get in any trouble. <laughs> I uh, I recently discovered from doing what we do, we've had clients come to us wanting us to do the labels for them because they think there's something wrong with our system. And they're like, yeah, I put my recipe in your system and it, like the sodium levels are like a thousand and we're like, okay, let's go check it out. And I realized there's a common theme with this one specific group of you know it's it's like it's the sodium it's so high in this group and I'm like being aware of it now and I'm like if I went to that type of restaurant yeah not knowing and I do I love that kind of food and I'm like is that what I've been eating yeah and now I'm seeing it because we were working with a client in that space and even the client was like whoa what's going on and we're like yeah yeah, it actually is. And we did all this testing and, and going back and forth. And we're like, Oh, oh, my goodness, like, this is bad. It's it's it, like this client we were working with, we had to substitute. Yeah, what they were using because it was so high in sodium, so much sugar, calories, yeah. like the calories were so high. And then we were when we were able to bring calories down, it didn't change the sodium. It's really like it was the sugar and the sodium, the carbohydrates were insane. Oh, so, now, wow. I, so now I'm like, I'm not going to go eat in that type of, um, you know, yeah, or, or, you know, that type of country food or yeah, yeah. Food. So mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm like that, that's insane. But, but then I'm like, what about people who don't know right. that information? they're going to these places, they're ordering this food, they're eating it and they have no idea. So someone with heart disease or high cholesterol like they're at risk. Yeah. Even high blood pressure. Yeah. And they have no idea that that meal that they're eating is, you know, killing them. Yeah. And I think that's the problem. 
there's times where I would go to a restaurant and I would put myself on the, on the scale the next day. And I was up like six, seven pounds. It was like insanity because of all the water retention from all the sodium that I endured and the sugar probably also, you know, and you know, you don't realize, but there is so much, especially processed foods. There is so much sodium and people at restaurants, they cook with so much sodium and they cook with so much sugar and that's why it tastes so good. But it's it's so dangerous for your health, especially if you do that consistently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hopefully one day we'll we'll get better. But that's our that's our mission with Menusano. We're just trying to change the way food access um, and information with it comes is accessible to to consumers. And hopefully one day we'll see everybody have that information, whether it's on their websites, whether it's on an app, whether it's a you know, on the menu, yeah, need access to that information. Where can you find Menusano? It's, uh, you can go on our website. It's menusano.com. So it's uh, M-E-N-O-S-A-N-O. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, you can check it out for anybody who's in the food service industry who wants a tool. It's uh, inexpensive, so easy to use. We built something that we built it with chefs, professional chefs, so it follows the the process just like in a professional kitchen. Oh, I, cool. I'm the founder, so I use it at home for myself all the time. Wow. Yeah, I'm I'm I, I love smoothies. So when I'm making them, I try to put everything into menu sano because I want to see what the results are, if it's actually healthy or not. So wow. I know about it and I, I I know a little bit more about nutrition than the average Joe just because I'm always experimenting with it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a great little tool for anybody who um, is in the food space and, and, and wants needs labels, number one, or wants uh, information for their websites and things like that. Oh, so that's very cool. cool. I like that. Now, if you had to give away a couple takeaways, like for everything we talked about today, what would you like to tell our listeners? It's okay not to feel okay. Yeah, just uh, be kind to yourself. Right. I, I always I have I have this thing written on my door every day before when I come in before I leave. It, it says, uh, be kind to yourself. You're doing the best you can. I think right. we're really hard on ourselves. We with social media, we look at other people's best lives and everyone's living this amazing life and doing these amazing things. And, you know, there's uh, people are in amazing relationships and you're not. And people have amazing careers and you don't. And that puts people in like a very depressing state. And we're yeah. trying achieve more and achieve more just because we're watching everybody else and I'm just yeah. like over it I'm just like be kind to yourself don't live you know for 50 years live for today just live your best life today exactly and most of those stories aren't even true if they sound too good to be true it probably is <laughs> yeah and you know what maybe someone's having a really good week but there's also bad days right what you yeah. see on social media is not a person's whole life exactly a hundred percent a hundred percent and for people who are trying to you know live their dream and and make their passion their future career what kind of advice would you like to give people who had a passion like you and a desire to overcome their obstacles and then do something that they really enjoy doing any advice for those people i got into tech without knowing anything about tech i got into oh, wow. it and so my advice to, to anyone who wants to do something maybe that they don't know much about or they just just learn just learn about the space learn about the industry learn about the product you want to be part of and um, when you do get into it you're gonna have a world of knowledge and I mean that's what I did I just I I, I started running a company because I knew every single role and I knew how to do every single job because I just took the time over those 17 years to learn that yeah um, and you someone more educated than me probably would not have to have done that to that right. degree mm -hmm. but for me personally that's just what I had to do I had to learn I had to uh you know just yeah just learn <laughs> right exactly you're persistent and you you follow your dream and you put a lot of hard work into it. You know, people have to realize things don't happen one, two, three. I think we have a very impatient society that, you know, has a dream, has an idea and they want results right away, but it never happens like that. It takes time. I think it's the the younger generation, like more towards the millennials. I'm a Gen X. So yeah. 
Gen X, Gen X, we're workhorses. That's what I always tell people. We're just like, <laughs> millennials just have a different mindset, and there's nothing wrong with millennials or the younger generation. I think they're they're going to probably go out and do amazing things. They're not going to have to work as hard as we did, but <laughs> there is a the the learning has to happen, and I find that because social media is about like you know just flipping sw- the the attention. The attention span, yeah. Uh, it's just like, you know, you can't watch something more than five minutes. So people are not reading as much because it's kind of boring. And they're not watching videos that are like more than 10, 15 minutes because they get bored because yeah. they're, just, they're they're learning that, that they're learning very fast learning. Yeah. So I think it takes a little bit of time. Uh, you know, building your career doesn't happen overnight. You have to mm-hmm. have a lot of patience. And also one thing that I'm going to say is if you ever want to get into like a management or a leadership position, there are skills that are required for you to get there. So it's not just about like building a tech company and being a founder and making a million dollars or 10 million. Like you have to hire a team. You have to train people. You have to have like HR skills and people skills and all of the stuff that you don't know. But that's one thing that I, I will tell people, just learn as much as you can and also learn a little bit of a business. Yes, I agree. That's yeah. really great advice. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. No. So if, if people want to get a hold of you, if they want to learn more about your apps, can you just tell us one more time what your website is? So the website is menusano.com. You can find me on LinkedIn, Sonia Kuro. And my Instagram handle is techie Sonia C. And I get a lot of messages there. So you're welcome to message me. Oh, very cool. And for the um, Facebook page, for the community, for people with, with um, breast cancer, where can they find that? So it's called Life Unleashed with two L's. Oh, I like that. I like and that. Also on um, Instagram. So Instagram and Facebook, Life Unleashed with two L's. Oh, great. This has been amazing. Thank you so much, Sonia, for coming on the show and sharing all this valuable information. Your story is just amazing and how you overcame it and what you went through and how you got yourself help and how you utilize the tools you use, you know, that you learned and how you made us, you know, a successful career. You know, it's just amazing. You know, kudos to you. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. This has been great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I, I hope, you know, maybe one day you can come back on the show because I'd love to have you back. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. You have a great day. You too. <laughs>